This is a TEDx Media House production. COVID-19 is not just a disease that has changed how we think about scientific issues, but it has also further revealed the broken socio-political structures in our society. Policies implemented as a result of the pandemic highlight the importance of considering gender in the impact and responses to COVID-19. For example, according to the World Bank, globally, women will likely experience a significant burden on their time given their multiple care responsibilities as school closures and confinement measures are adopted, possibly leading to reductions in working time and permanent exit from the labor market. In today's episode, we dive into the gender dimensions of COVID-19 with Everjoyce Wynn, EJ. EJ is a Zimbabwean feminist activist and is currently the International Director of Programs and Global Engagement at ActionAid. She has worked with various women's rights movements and organizations in Zimbabwe and beyond. In 1992, together with Terry Bonds, EJ published To Live a Better Life, An Oral History of Women in the City of Harare, 1930 to 1970. The book is an extraordinary seminal historical text that centers ordinary people and presents 18 different topics dealing with the lives of women. In this interview, we discuss the parallels between the HIV and AIDS pandemic, the presence of stigma in a time of COVID, and how the current pandemic has revealed the gender inequality in our society. Before we get into this episode, we would like to acknowledge that we stand with the victims of political violence and repression in Zimbabwe. We condemn the use of state violence as a tool of oppression and look for the creation of a free democratic space for all. You're listening to Taking Into Account. Thank you so much for finding the time to do this. So um, the first question I have for you is... Uh, stems from an article that you wrote from uh, Just Associates, uh, which highlighted the similarities between HIV and AIDS stigma and COVID-19 stigma, at least in the Southern African context. Beyond stigma mm. and from your experiences, what other parallels can be drawn on the African continent between the HIV and AIDS pandemic and COVID-19? So, I mean, you know, there's the obvious, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they are both caused by viruses, right? Mm. And, and therein lies the first challenge, something that you can't see, right? Um, so for many of us, it, it becomes very difficult to explain to people, um, for them to visualize what you're talking about, right? Um, hence the fear. So that's the first reaction is, 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 is fear, right? then the fear gets exaggerated and exacerbated by the media in terms of how they report on it. So I actually wanted to write a tweet this morning. I forgot, (laughs) you know, ZBC, because I listen to ZBC even if I'm here, Mm -hmm. right? I listen to the radio in the morning. I I watch ZTV news at eight, like I always did. you know, I watch it online, and they keep talking about, you know, the, the deadly coronavirus. Mm. That's that's how they talk about it. And I wanted to tweet and say, well, cars are very deadly. But you don't describe it as, you know, Jane bought her deadly Mercedes Benz. So why are you describing yes. We all know that, you know, the chances are you might die. Mm-hmm. But actually, the higher chances are that you will live, as we have seen. But that's how they keep talking about the deadly coronavirus, the deadly coronavirus. Um, And and the impact of that, right, you know, is fear-inducing in many people and because it's something that you can't see. Maybe let me talk about this not seeing piece, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because Mm -hmm. it's important for me to explain what I mean. So, you know, when I was coming here, I came here on the 20th of March 
and the reason here being Johannesburg. The reason I came here is because I am asthmatic, um, chronically so, but also I have um, another autoimmune condition. And my doctors on both sides of the border said, look, you're better off being in a place if you have medical aid in Joburg, it's better for you to be there. Right. The health system works and the government does work, <laughs> you know, whatever whatever we might think of it. Yeah. And so I came and, and when I kept talking to, so first I, I was talking to the woman who, uh, you know, comes to clean my house and does my laundry and, and I'm telling her, listen, I'm going away. I don't know when I'll be back. And then she says, Saka Murkwenda kwa chiri chirguere chacho. So I said, well, my dear, it's everywhere. It's she everywhere. says, ah, kuna ajisa ticha shika. And so in, 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 and in the way she was articulating it, right? It, it, she was articulating it like a lion that's coming. So she's like, Murkwenda kwa chiri kwa chacho. You know, that's the image I had in my head. But, you know, I didn't want to be rude to her. So yeah. I, I was like, listen, um, it's fine. Um, you know, I'll that's why I have a medical aid. So, you know, yeah. then I come. But in literally up until today, you know, my cousins, people who should know better, I'm talking people with university degrees, I'm talking computer engineers, we have three in the family, mm-hmm. I'm, you know, accountants, I'm talking somebody with a PhD in craft <laughs> sciences, right? And I keep on saying, my hand is real job. No question. And, and so it's, it's, I keep thinking, what's the image in, in, in these people's heads, right? And again, I, then I go back to Lillian, right? The woman mm-hmm. I was telling you about. That there is this image of this virus being some kind of a lion that you can see coming towards you. It's a physical thing. Um, and, and, and I'll come back to the global media in terms of that. Um, you know, and... and and then you saw the, the, you know, the large numbers of Zimbabwean women and, you know, particularly who were living here, running back across the border just before the border closed at the end of March. And they were all going on and, you know, they said, BC, I remember interviewing them, like, why did you come back? They say, oh, you know, like it's full over there, there yeah. and he doesn't exist. Huh? And, and, and now... I, I really wonder where those women are. I really wonder what they must be thinking. I really wonder what, you know. Um, oh, but anyway, back to Lillian. She <laughs> then, apparently, she she and her sisters, they they all lived in Chitungiza. They lived together. And so apparently, the other day, I was trying to call her because she has my set of keys, and I was trying to get my keys to give somebody. And um, so I had then to ask my friend, I said, um, I can't get through to her. Can you call her from there? She says, oh, I found her. She says, I'm like, I'm serious. So they're running away. So right now. <laughs> yes, physically, because she was a child. You know, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just thought I should tell you all of these stories yeah. because I think they're really very significant mm-hmm. in terms of how people understand what this is and how they interpret it and how they will then respond at an individual level, but how they will also respond, you know, to the next person. And 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 so coming back to your question, so you know, that's exactly the same thing that that we then saw with HIV. Yeah. Um, but I think then the difference, you know, this time around is like everybody's is, is in danger. Da, da, da. Um, um, but again, because of this fear and because of the role that the media is playing in particular, um, before we talk about our incompetent governments and, and, and how they are also, you know, fermenting a particular narrative. Um, you know, the, then there is the the the, so the 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 message now is, but it has to have a cause, right? So there has to be people that you must be scared of, who are vectors of this disease. So with HIV, mm-hmm. it was sex workers, um, then it became truck drivers, uh, and then of course it had started with you know gay men, mm-hmm. right? So it was gay sex workers, and then it was truck drivers. 
So, you know, the, the enemy kept shifting. It was those people, right? Yeah. Um, then, so the similarity with, with COVID, right? It was the Chinese, and then it was the Europeans, the Italians in particular, and, you know, uh, the British. And, um, you know, now it's the returnees. So in, in the context of Zim, so, you know, they have now labeled us. So those of us who, when we're coming home, the returnees, we, we now have a, that is a phrase, it right? Is, yeah. a, so there is an enemy that you yes. can point to, that you can blame, that you can run away from, because if you can't run away from the virus itself, because you can't see it, but you can see its embodiment, it's the other person, yes. right? Yeah. And, and that's, and, and, and that narrative is very strong and, and they, they are continuing and the media continues despite, you know, some of us writing, despite people protesting, they continue with that. And, and it's, it's similar. That's exactly what happened with HIV, right? So we wasted close to 15 years um, with people in denial, with people not yeah. taking care of themselves. Yeah. Um, and I want to bring it to, you know, the subject close to my heart. You then had the tragedy of married women believing that HIV was something to do with those women over there, i.e. sex workers, i.e. so-called small houses, you know? We didn't call them small houses in the 90s, yeah. right? Um, but, you know, they were all sex workers regardless. Um, even those of us who take care of their husbands were small houses, but never mind. Um, <laughs> I like that. I like that. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Right. Right. Yes. So it, it, sadly, they became sitting ducks, right? Right. And this is why sooner rather than later, the statistics shifted. The sex workers became safer because they took care of themselves, because they educated themselves, because they, you know, um, said, fine, you know, we're going to do what we need to do to survive. So you go on and, you know, point fingers. Right. Married women became sitting ducks and they died in their thousands, right. right? And young women continue to die because they are wanting to get married to these right. older men with, you know, uh, the virus. Yeah. And so that's exactly, I am seeing the same pattern, unfortunately. Um, I am really, really hoping um, but there is no there is very little reason for me to hope that mm. it's it's going to be different mm -hmm. because again we've wasted what is it now four months yeah. by yeah looking over there right. those people um yesterday you know, here is a who they've come out and said community transmission is now the concern in africa right yes it's jumped all of the other stages it's like we we are straight into community transmission but yeah. will ZBC report on that? No. no. We're still busy chasing the returnees. Even this morning, they were reporting. There were 13 new cases, 12 are returnees. Then there is the one person who we can't quite figure out why she ended up with it. Exactly. And the rules are stricter for returnees. From, from my experience, I, I had to quarantine for eight days. And... I had my temperature checked twice a day and my uh, oxygen whatnot checked twice a day. Uh, had my PCR test on day number seven, day number eight. Uh, it was negative, but I'm still supposed to test after, at day 21 just in case. However, the rules are not the same for you know people that have been here. And so that goes to what you're saying, that the target is returnees. It's... but. If we don't have it, and not that not we, we all don't have it, but like you said, that one person, how yeah. do they get it if they're not a returnee? And are they yeah. the same rules for testing? Are they the same systems put in place? And that is non-existent. And that and the media is perpetuating the stigma, like you said. You Would you mind going a little bit more yeah. into that as well, actually? The language, beyond the language around it, the imagery as well, and the focus that's going on, um, comparing, I guess, global media and Zimbabwean media, since you said you're consuming quite a bit of it, um, how 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 is the media perpetuating the stigma? So of course, you know, I mean, in the early days, right? Yeah. We we took our cue from so-called global media. So you know, your ZBCs, your SABCs would simply regurgitate what was on CNN or BBC or whatever it is, right? Yeah. Um, 
but but I want to focus on one particular aspect, and I know I'm I'm very I'm, I'm becoming like a broken record talking about this particular issue because I'm I suffer from this peculiar condition called trypophobia. Um, you know about that. You know it's the it's the, the it's a condition where if you look at something with like irregular shapes or like oh like little small like bumps is that the one holes and bumps yeah you yeah okay yeah sick. Yes. It has a name. So I just thought I was weird. It actually has a name and I'm I've very glad. Yes. Us and I found, you know, fellow sufferers on Twitter. It's horrible. Mm-hmm. So that global media, each and every one of them, right? The only one I never watched was Sky. So I actually should watch Sky. Mm-hmm. But, you know, all of them, particularly BBC and Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera, which happens to be my favorite, so I'll go to town about that particular one. <laughs> yeah. Literally. Thank God for Black Lives Matter, because now that thing behind them has been taken down. But like for the last three months, Al Jazeera had the most horrific background. I don't know if you saw it. The, the 3D pink, of, the, of the virus, red, right? The viruses yeah. behind and the newscasters, yeah. and you know, they and after Christmas, you know, this year they had unveiled their new look, right? So their readers are no longer sitting down, they're standing and they're walking across the globe and they've changed like this pretty sort of red and purple colors. And I remember celebrating with purple, but soon enough in February, suddenly all of that turned pink red with the virus. If you can imagine, That's you know what I mean? Like, yeah. So at some points, and because I, I love watching the news, I want to know what's going on. It's, it's part of my job. I have to watch, you know, global news. But, you know, so I would be watching, I would be listening to the news, but I couldn't watch. Because literally, I start scratching myself. Yeah. If, if, if it gets intense enough, I just feel like I need, I need to scratch yeah. or I throw up. Yeah. If it's, so, yeah, ZBC ones, I don't even watch. They have a particularly horrid one. You should just try and see one of the days. It looks like something. Try to stay away from ZBC. It gets me angry. So, (laughs) oh no, no, you should, you should just watch it just for the virus picture. Just you know what I mean. Yeah, it looks like something that's come straight out of the sewer. Mm -hmm. So you, so for the average person who didn't do biology, or even for the person who did, when they're trying to visualize what this thing is, that's the imagery, right? Right. And I think the contrast, though, with with um, with with that and, and HIV is is that with HIV, because they couldn't show us the virus, although they tried with imagery, but it wasn't so as graphic as now. Mm-hmm. They then showed us the people, right? right. So the images of your Freddie Mercury's, right? Um, you know the, the first, you know, cases as they were called, victims, right? Um, the emaciated, you know, barely breathing, you know, Always stick and bone yeah. became the embodiment of HIV, right? So with COVID, they they have decided that you know because you can't see it and the the visual imagery of a person with it. Is, is still hard to construct, you know, except the one who's on a ventilator, right? right? We decided to bring the virus out of the body and have it right. intensely red. Right. <laughs> right? Red and purple, right. yeah. I don't know how many of these webinars you've attended since, since the virus. A lot. You know, okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my dear. Have you seen how people even put it on their PowerPoint presentations? The, the no, other... nobody has put it on the ones I've been in. Oh, no. You've been very lucky. Uh, the yeah. other day, I, you know, I swear, I had to ask this guy. We were doing a training for our staff um, because it's mandatory when you're coming back to the office and reopening, you have to do a basic COVID training. And they had put the virus on every one of the slides. I said, I'm sorry, we have to stop this because I'm going to get sick. Each slide. Yeah. Do you have something else? Yeah. And I go, okay. You can change it. I'm like, so we had to stop. They had to change it. I, I, it's just, I'm like, it's not necessary. Yeah. yeah. You know. That becomes interesting, the images that are then created, because what you mentioned was with, with, with AIDS, what happened was, you know, 
social groups, particular social groups were targeted as the image, right? Even in the media. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then yeah. I think what yeah. becomes interesting with COVID is that they tried not to not to do that, uh, first of all, yeah. because it, it was, you know, we could talk about like power and yeah. who, who, who tested positive or whatever first, ETC. But then also it's just like what you're talking about is the negative effect of that, which is how horrid the imagery then becomes. And not and not only for people yeah. that that actually suffer from the condition you mentioned, but also when we try to visualize ourselves, mm. you just what you see yeah. is something that you don't understand and is very scary looking. Um yeah. yeah. And one of the things you mentioned I'd like to actually go on to talk about, you talked about an interview that you watched that had women crossing the border back, Zimbabwean women crossing from South Africa back into Zimbabwe. Um, what I find interesting is that a lot of the times, uh, I mean, as you know about how many women hold together households in Zimbabwe, the informal economy, about over 70% of it or so they say, um, is, is, is women. Um, and we have seen how COVID-19 has exposed quote unquote i don't think it has i just think people are now paying attention but has exposed all of these social and political you know structures that have been amiss in a lot of cases um and i want to focus on women and and the economy and 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 the work that they do and the households they're holding together and how that has sort of been broken down by covid19 what do you what do you think has been the greatest the greatest loss and what gains can be made um, by African women going forth uh, from this? You know, uh, I, I, we often laugh with, with the women in, 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 in development circles that, you know, every time when, when people are just lazy to, to do the analysis, they'll just say, especially women and girls. You know, just take case, it on. That, that's what it is. Yeah. Right. That, that's what it is. Yeah. Um, you know, they say COVID is worse if you have an underlying condition, right? Mm -hmm. As an individual. I often extend that to say then COVID will be the impact of COVID will be worse depending on the underlying mm -hmm. structural conditions. Right. right in yes. in the similar way yes. um right yeah and so those underlying things are um you know um patriarchy neocolonialism racism right um as as capitalism yeah. right yeah. the big systems mm -hmm. globally mm -hmm. right and then our context as well and so naturally in the context of all of those, um, you know, COVID simply exposes those fault lines, right? And and that's been uh, you know, analyzed by so many other more capable people than myself with statistics and facts and figures. I don't keep those in my head, but it's, you know, it's out there, mm -hmm. right? So whether you're thinking about um, women as health workers, they are the majority of the health workers at, at the bottom of the pile. So they are the nurses um, with longer working hours. They are the um, hospital cleaners, right? Mm -hmm. um, the people who do the registration of people when they appear in hospitals, in the doctor's rooms. So they are on the front line in the real sense, you know, never mind the war imagery, which is unfortunate, but let's stick with it. Um, and let's not forget, again, that globally in the last sort of 50 years of IMF World Bank policies, or it's 75 now, by the way. So there was 50 years is not enough way back. It's now 75 years of the World Bank and IMF, right? Globally, um, you have seen the underinvestment, if not the divestment from public services. Um, and from sectors where women predominate, right? And governments have been told to keep the wages down. Um, if you go to my organization's website, ActionAid, you will see a report that we recently did called Who Cares? Um, you know, um, which is looking at the many years of the impacts of structural adjustment, um, which they now call by any other name, 
and how that has been exposed. You know, they were saying that structural adjustment ended, it didn't. Um, if you just look at how governments have not been, you know, hiring more nurses, paying them decent wages, et cetera, et cetera, and now we are paying the price, even in a country like the UK, what they've been doing with the NHS, right? Um, and, and so that's, that's your women out there, right, in terms of, um, you know, the health system. Then you come to the issues around water, right? So water is the, is the one big thing that we are all being told we need oodles of in order to be safe and to be protected. So you have to keep washing your hands. Um, and, you know, again, as so very many of us kept tweeting and saying, you know, you need to wash your water for two hands for 20 seconds and everybody would say, with what water? From where? <laughs> right? And again, for me, that's one of the reasons I left home because in the avenues now where I live, um, we had water, it came, it turned, it got turned on and it came. Now I'm talking as if it's an animal. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, <it's okay. laughs> Tuesday, <laughs> Tuesday night, um, Wednesday, Thursday, by Friday morning, it's off. And we were the lucky ones, yes. by the way. Yeah. We were the lucky ones. Yeah. If you live the other side of the avenue, the lower part, most people got it at least once a week and maybe one day on a Monday and that was it. So if you don't have a tank, if you don't have a boho, if you don't have, you know, but how many people can do that? Yeah. Right. And um, so who are the people who have to find the water? Who are the people who have to queue up for the water? Who are the people who need to wash bath, you know, everybody, it's it's the women. Yeah. Um, as much as the men can claim, oh, I will drive and put the jugubu and go and look for the water. But, you know, that's the more luxurious side. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and so it's the women, both in rural areas and in urban areas, yeah, yeah. right? And I want to add here that in a context of climate change, where water is becoming a scarce commodity, particularly in rural areas, you know, water is now further and further and further away from where women live. So the amount of unpaid care work, the amount of, you know, um, household labor that the women have to do, which has never been counted in GDP, which has never been seen as important, yeah. right? And we know that. It's, it's all out there. It's yeah. exposed. Then you talk about the other impacts in terms of the, again, socioeconomic, you know, the shutdowns, the lockdowns, right? Um, I think you're familiar very much with the stories around, um, you know, gender-based violence, yes. which has increased yeah. for the very many reasons that we know. Um, and this comes on the back of the fact that if you look at a country like Zimbabwe, the government of Zimbabwe does not provide shelters no. for survivors of violence. That is a service run purely by NGOs, right? Musasa is the only organization that provides shelter. Um, you then have the others like your, you know, uh, so what is CSU's full name? Uh, uh, Council uh, Unit. So but, you know, they yes. do that mostly for survivors of political violence. They don't do that for, you know, your guardian variety yeah. violence against women. Yeah. So where is Amusa supposed to get? So, you know, everybody's like, yeah, you know, these women, they must do something. Where are the feminists? Well, we are here busy trying to shelter the women. Thank you very much. But, you know, we, we, we in fact, it's very interesting. I, I actually want to talk to one of the people at Musasa and say, can you just do a public appeal? You know, like, let's see how much money we're going to get from Zimbabwe. Yeah. Like how people have come to the aid of Samantha, you know, that young woman in Chitungiza who's giving. Oh, the, the soup kitchen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is like, lovely. Yeah. But let's test the system. Yes. You know, we've never tested yes. to say, let's do a public appeal. Such you know, um, on the street election, crowd funding yeah. for women's shelter. Let's actually see if people are going to be willing to put money in there. Really but of idea. course, you Yes, now suddenly stories are ah, mm. you know, now becoming more problematic because you are spending time in the home and you don't have jobs and now running graduate. So the narrative will suddenly change. But let's see. So you have the impact of you know uh, violence is what I'm talking about. Yeah. 
uh, the unpaid care increasing, if you're talking about, you know, education, schools are shut down, this so-called homeschooling, um, you know, who is supposed to be doing this homeschooling? Of course, we know it's the women who are having to do it. Yes. Um, but meanwhile, you know, the same women working. Like, I can give you examples, countless examples of yeah. many of my colleagues who I have had to say to them, listen, you don't, you don't have to keep taking your leave and you don't have to keep telling me every two minutes you are away from the computer. Just do what you have to do. And if a meeting is happening and if your daughter is having a meltdown over some exercise, please just, you know, action aid is not going to collapse because your daughter needed help. Just go do it. You will be back tomorrow. It's fine. Um, you know, but that's us. That's me. That's that's you as a, as right? a leader. In the, yeah, not everyone working is from home. Yeah. Um, yeah, has had massive, massive impact on 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 women's lives, on on their health, on mental health. The horror stories that my colleagues from the global north have been telling us. Mm. Oh, I mean, at least we've got domestics. Um, with all of the problems that that comes with, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Acknowledging that, but there's that, and if mostly with our families, some mm -hmm. of us. Um, so that has kind of helped. But imagine a woman, you know, one of my colleagues, for instance, she and her husband, they've got two kids, ten and eight, um, living in a three-bedroom flat. So normally, what would happen is they would leave their kids with either his parents or her parents. So now they couldn't leave the kids with those mm -hmm. parents because they are the ones at risk. And so what was then happening is they are spending 24-7 with these two mm -hmm. children, you know, in a very, very small space. And she's always, was always in tears. Every time I'm talking to her, and then you just say to her, listen, just, it's okay. We can have the meeting tomorrow. But, you know, they, 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 they had to work. And, and that was the reality in a context in which care work, um, you know, was not valued, was not being provided by the state. Yes. And then you shut down the school and, and you just expect that somebody's going to do it. And that's also becoming, that. What, what is interesting about, about the anecdotes that you've shared is that there's, there are similarities between, you know, people try people think that some people are protected maybe by, by, by class from, from some of these problems. But, you know, I'm, I'm thinking... For example, I think the first week, the first week there was a lockdown in Zim. Uh, was that the week police burnt vendors' goods and 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 things like that um, mm. in in Zimbabwe mm. in, in Harare actually? Um, and what I find interesting, no, well, not interesting, but then see, so they burnt things down. Most vendors are 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 women, and they're probably breadwinners as well. If if we if we know our stats. Um, then they're going to be forced to go home to feed for people, to feed people. Mm -hmm. Their jobs and materials, inputs, capital, everything has totally been destroyed. Now they are locked into this one situation. You know, in it, it's like no one is protected by. You know, it's happening every, ac across. You know, class divides. Um, women mm -hmm. being affected by by this in very different and very similar mm -hmm. ways as well. And that's that. That's something I guess that the uh, mm. COVID has 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 exposed um, for me. Sorry, you were asking about, but what are the opportunities, right? Yeah. I mean, look, in every crisis, there is always some opportunities. So they have not. The fact that these fault lines have been exposed so glaringly, I think, has been a godsend. Because all of these things that women have been saying for the longest time, and nobody was listening to us, suddenly everybody's like, ah, oh, really? So who's supposed to, you know, like <laughs> the homeschooling and spending time with children? That it is like, ah, now we're supposed to be spending time with them. Again, <laughs> another story. So, you know, I have a very close male friend, yeah. married, and child. Um, both him and wife had, had jobs, but so he's, you know, he goes to work, he's, he's on shifts, but normally what he does is he goes in the morning, by the time his shift is done, he doesn't do the whole day, so he's done. But he's now you know, in town, hanging out with friends, studying mm. for his degree, 
my wife has a full-time job in hairdressing. And of course, now she can't go to work. That's the sector that's mostly been impacted and, you know, it's going to be one of the last ones to reopen. reopen yeah. So each time I'm talking to him, I'm like, so how are you? It's, like, ah, 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 it's terrible. I'm like, what is terrible? He's like, can you imagine? We're not having to spend a whole day with the child. The whole day. Oh. And I'm like, hello, child. this is your child, daddy. <laughs> I know what I love, my child. And, and you can feel the stress. You know? <laughs> Every little opportunity he gets to get out. <laughs> For me, on a Saturday at 7 p.m., where are you? <laughs> Just hanging out with the nope. boys. Yeah. And, and where are you hanging out? I'm so in so's car. So, you know, because oh, it's lockdown. So they're now can, hanging out in the car. Yeah. <laughs> You know, but they, they just needed to leave the house and go and park somewhere and yeah. inside the car just to get away from the children. Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, but they all see, they are appreciating, you know, and I've been having conversations with people like yeah. to say, so you understand. Yeah. Now you see sometimes you need to get home when you finish your shift so that you can spend time with the child. This business of you now waiting until your wife also knocks off so that the both of you can now be getting home same time. Right. You know, right. <laughs> so that you have a buffer. Yeah, I can't do that. You know, this is a skill that women have. And I say, no. it's not, it's not inbuilt. No. You know, we don't come no. with the manual. Exactly. That's not how to take care of you. Exactly. It's a learned thing. Exactly. Everybody has to learn it. But I think also in terms of policy, I think we are beginning to see governments responding. Right, particularly to issues around gender-based violence, uh, the need for you know safe spaces for women, uh, support systems, you know uh, the justice system. I think um, you know just the massive. I was knocking the media earlier, but I think they have done a very good job in terms of keeping tabs on that and exposing and talking about. Uh, you know, violence across the world. It, there's never been a moment that I remember in history. Mm. Even when we had, you know, the young woman gang raped by, I don't know, 12 men in India mm. and you know, that one who has disappeared in Brazil. You know, you, you haven't had this much outpouring of like consternation and concern. And, um, and so that's been, that's been amazing to see. But of course, you know, the proof shall be much clearer three years from now. You know, what did, what were we left with? Do we now have better services? Do we now have mm-hmm. better justice systems? Do we now have, you know, better sentencing patterns, et cetera, et cetera. I think that we can only take stock of three years from now, not, not, not now. Now you are just seeing the major reactions but whether this is going to be sustainable i think but for now let's celebrate the gains let's celebrate the conversation the awareness you know etc um i think that's been good um you know the way that people are now also talking you know civil society generally people are now also talking about public services right because people are seeing that it's a human right that yes, there is, you can take care of yourself and you can say, I can lift myself by my bootstraps. But to be honest, there comes a point at which you trip on those bootstraps of yours. <laughs> yeah. um, we need systems, we need structural change that benefits the majority. Yes. That is to how much you can protect yourself, you know. So the awareness, I think that we are all dependent on each other. Your safety, your security, your health, your, your right to live mm-hmm. is dependent on the next person. You know, I think has COVID has 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 done that, um, and it's showing that. And I and I hope you know um, we can sustain that momentum through other campaigns, through other conversations. Uh, you know, going forward. Um, yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I thank you. I'd forgotten that I'd also asked about uh, what yeah. the gains. And thank you so much for reminding me about that. And then while we have focus on, on, on gender-based violence in general, it seems, and this is very, I want to make this very specific to, to, to Zimbabwe for a moment, state-sponsored violence seems to be business as usual, which, we, you know, even, even, even during a pandemic. 
you know, we have I talked about the the vendors. We've seen like Muramba China, quote unquote, like a version of it go on, and also <laughs> obviously more jarringly the, the 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 issue around the the abduction of you know of of opposition, uh, whatever conversations are going on around that, and so you know, do you think that the fact that some of these things are happening during a pandemic? would any of the responses that we have in policies address systems and the state directly, or is that a gap or is there a gap between understanding, you know, social issues and, 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 and state political issues in our context? But why did we all imagine that because there is a pandemic, suddenly this state would transform itself to become a caring state and a and, and non-political actor and True. and that they wouldn't take advantage of a pandemic. True. I guess we were just hoping they would the at least election. pause for health, for public health no. reasons, but you're right. No. You're right. This is why, you yeah. know, we also need to understand that every crisis is an opportunity, right? But who gets to take advantage of that opportunity yeah. is where the challenge lies. So let, let me get out of Zimbabwe for a while. So sure. and let me talk to you about the, the, the you know the emergencies that, that I have personally witnessed. So, you know, my first big one was the Nepal earthquake. Mm-hmm. Massive loss of life, massive, you know, of course, you know, impacts on poor and excluded people in that country, and there are very many in the most remote rural areas, in the most mountainous places that, you know, that place, I mean, you go through those mountains, just going into them for two hours, suddenly your head is like, how they even live there, I I have no idea, but let let me not digress. But this became an opportunity for very many people to do very many bad things. Examples. People who have always wanted to take land from the poor peasants suddenly found an opportunity. So because people were displaced and they were now in these camps and in these tents and whatever. So now the idea was, no, you know, you can't go back to those villages of yours uh, because the geophysicists are telling us that there is going to be aftershocks and there is going to be more earthquakes in another 10 years. So you should move. Then, Human trafficking, that's when it peaked during such a crisis. The first thing you do is women's protection. That's why in my organization, the work that we do is about protecting women's rights, women's leadership, and making sure that we have our eyes open to violence against women and girls, right? Because that's the time, you know, people are running around. This one has lost their mother. They are not knowing where they are. Or the mother is now wanting food to eat, to give to the boys. Because, you know, those things don't go away because you suddenly have an ethnic. They just get worse. So, of course, we're going to sell them or abuse them, as the case may be. Then escalate that to regional geopolitics. You suddenly had the government of India being very nice to Nepal. And you think, oh, how lovely. What a good neighbor. Oh, no, 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 no. India had found an opportunity to finally get into Nepal. And they were not going to leave. So fortunately, the Nepal government was like, eh, eh, everybody else can come, but not you. That took a lot of trying to convince even the donors who were like, ah. Why are you saying you are waiting for the Americans or the British or whoever it is? Your neighbor is trying to offer you help and you are refusing. And Nepal is like, we know these people. (laughs) Yeah. Every crisis has opportunities for all kinds of reasons, right? And so we, everybody needs to have that mindset. How do we identify those opportunities and capitalize on those opportunities in a positive way, which is in a human rights-based way, because those who want to violate human rights will take advantage of the crisis. So going back to your question is, you know, it's important to appreciate. So, I mean, you've seen me every night I watch the TV, so I'll be watching them, right? Every night they're on TV. These people have never been busy yet outside of an election year than the way they are now. Yeah. And they are busy. People are being put into, and they are busy saying social distancing, stay at home. They are the ones who are pulling people outside <laughs> of their homes and bringing them under the tree. 
for every months. day okay. there is a count more than 50 people yeah. ed is not going east <laughs> she went going west yeah. i am nanga going south yeah. you know duke is going north i have never been busier as i've been over the last couple of weeks and it is it is interesting to watch that is true this is not about covid they don't give a hoot about that you and true. me that is true and up and no 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 they are campaign everybody's now busy you know <laughs> who was i loving it last night you know what i'm saying i want to be unkind and say oh joshua malinga is still alive i mean the man is almost half dead and there he was donating ppes you know like i think the 10 back of you know that is the you like dude Seriously, you brought the TV cameras to witness the donation of like 10 packets of face masks. For Not ops. even any kind of face masks <laughs> that can be washed. No, 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 no. The disposable ones, which can only be used once. And there's a whole song and dance that Joshua Malinga has donated. But then you have to remember, you know, Joshua Malinga wants to be back in parliament as the representative of the disabled until he dies, whatever that is. Um, and you are seeing this as well. So it's not unique to them, let me say. It is not. Yeah. Um, you know, you've seen how globally there's been an outcry about how, you know, the use of this tracing um, yes. business, yes, it is basically now being used for surveillance yes. of, of everybody, yeah. right? Good case in point, the government of South Korea you can say, great, they have managed to contain the virus. But you know what? What does that mean for individual rights to privacy. Those people have none. Did you see how within like three hours of that young man having gone to, I uh, don't know how many discos he went, tracked 2,000 people that he had been in contact with overnight. You know, it didn't take them two days. Overnight, they had tracked 2,000 and tested and treated them. one person. Yeah. That should scare us. That level of surveillance. Yeah. You know, we've been talking about the closing of civic space as a civil society for quite a while now. Yes. And unfortunately, these lockdowns, you know, the fact that we were not on the street meant they, the governments had, and the militaries had control of the street, whether it's in the Philippines, whether it's in South Korea, whether it's in Brazil, whether it's, you know, here in South Africa, where, you know, three quarters of the South African military is on the street. The military is not... People's protector, as we all know, they are not well known for their human rights protections. Mm -hmm. So Zimbabwe is no exception, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We could have seen it coming. And as I said, the fact that you know, people could not be on the streets and could not organize. But which is why now, you know, with this Black Lives Matter and, you know, it's, it's not necessarily in some cases that people are in for Black Lives Matter. It's just like... <laughs> they just want to be outside. Finally. <laughs> Finally, I'm on the street. <laughs> don't, don't even know Winston Churchill is, but you know, I will be going to that study with everyone else just to get out of the house. We want to believe that they do care, but hey, three months behind closed doors. I mean, that's a very important lesson. Thank you for reminding me of that. Uh, that, you know, as, as much as you talk about yeah. opportunities that we have for change, there's also opportunities for more oppression. And, you know, systems oh, yeah. to refine themselves and basically become stronger. And mm. I guess it's like a p constant uh, push-pull mm. thing going on. Thank you. Is there, before I go into rapid fire questions to do with nothing, is there anything that you really wish I'd asked you that you think, you know, is important for people to learn or understand, um, you know, from your experience and from your expertise especially? I mean, I haven't said anything about young people. Right, and I think that's a very important. And I want to link with a question that I did not make time to answer. You know, you were talking earlier about opportunities. So, you know, with all the trouble that COVID has caused, and and I don't want to, you know, say it. Those are out outpaced by the positives, but I think my message would be you know, for young people to say, again, you know, each historic moment, each historic opportunity, for each historic moment, right, comes with also opportunities, right? Challenges, yes, but, but opportunities. So 
I think that's the first thing. And before I, 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 I say what are the opportunities for young people, but also to say, you know, very often I, I came into what I do now uh, completely by accident. You know, I didn't sit there and I, you know, like, I would like to be a feminist and an activist and change the world by the time I'm 55. <laughs> that would be a lie, right? I came into what I do now completely by accident. I grew up with no notion of feminism or women's rights. Or, you know, I grew up with a neighbor who used to beat up his wife and we just used to think that's the thing that men do on Thursday night. And, 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 and I did not have a heightened you know, consciousness. And so I don't want to be like, and I always grew up with a sense of injustice. I didn't. Mm-hmm. That's my grandfather had two and a half wives. My uncle had three. Two and a half, yeah. yeah. So it was, it was just the way it was, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, that was life. So, but, you know, you all have access to information much more than we ever had. You have, uh, you know, a lot more opportunity to study, to travel, but also, even if you don't have that, you, you have opportunity to have access to other people who are talking about these issues, right? In our time, people didn't talk about women's rights. We didn't talk about politics. We didn't talk about our government. You know, we, we just didn't. It was not a subject in school, right? You know, we, we were the last generation to go through the sort of the colonial education system. And so it, it, all this wokeness wasn't surrounding us. It, it is now. And so what I want to say, so there's often this mistaken notion, you would see, you know, uh, you hear young people say, you know, all these people who don't want to get out of positions and make way for us, and they don't want to mentor us, and they don't want to. And I always say, it, you know, it, nobody's going to put up a flip chart and hold a, you know, cocky pen and be like, right, now I'm going to mentor you. It's not going to happen. It might happen if you're lucky, right? If you deliberately ask somebody and they have the time. But quite frankly, all of us are so exhausted. Many of us don't have the time. So it's it's about being deliberate in is what I'm saying. Um you 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 are you can be deliberate about this is where I want to go, this is who I need to talk to, this is you may not know their names, right? Um, but you, you should have at least a vague notion, you know, of what's out there. Um, and so putting yourself, um, and I'm using that not in the bad American sense of putting yourself out there, but you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> there. Yeah. And, and, and being willing and, and, and curious and, you know, wanting it for yourself because nobody will be like, Right. Now sit down and and this is leadership and and we're going to give it to you. A friend of mine used to say the world is run by those who participate. (laughs) So participate, participate, participate. Even if your ideas sound silly and wacky and unformed and it takes time, it's fine. Just participate. Online, offline, conversations, a protest here where you can. Make the connections, even if you are in the UK, make the connections with your own home, even if you don't know anybody who's been impacted by COVID, but it's something that's affecting all of us. And so what I'm saying is, you know, for young people, this is an opportunity. Going back to that, you know, issue of every crisis comes with opportunity. So what are the opportunities that you see of making change happen, of doing things differently? Um, of organizing and mobilizing your own community of young people, of getting involved in something that brings about change, getting involved in, you know, protesting. And I don't mean, you know, being on the street throwing stones and I'm not saying, you know, go get yourself arrested. I, I don't, I'm not advocating for that. I am saying in whatever space and in whatever way to make your voice heard, and to make the collective voice of young people be heard because you're the ones who are facing this crisis. The fact that we don't have public health care in Zimbabwe is your crisis. So focus on the issues. Don't focus on the personalities. Focus on the issues. What is the issue? What's the thing, the person? What's the thing that that concerns you? Because that 
activism is about. Activism is about solving problems that affect people or that affect you. It's not about getting so and so into elected office. I think that's where we're getting it. Getting him elected into office to do what exactly? Let's start with the what before we talk about the who, right? Because the minute you start talking about the who, what if what if they disappoint you? This who? Well, I am very big disappointment. And you're like, ah, yes, neither. Yep. Because <laughs> that <it> makes you, <laughs> you know. Yeah, they so mostly so always important. disappoint anyway. So yeah. What are those things that you care about in this moment that have yeah. been exposed for you? So what is this moment for you as as young people? What are you seeing? What are you concerned about? So make your voice heard in whatever way that you can. So this is this is the moment to show leadership. So leadership is not about, you know, elected position or being in a directorship of an organization. It's about seeing that there is something that needs to be done and 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 being the voice for change um, and or for setting an agenda. So what's the agenda at this moment? I I don't know what the youth's agenda in Zimbabwe is at this moment. I don't. I mean, other than you all wanting to elect somebody, your fixation on elections. I don't know I, your issues, to be honest. I, I, I agree with that. That, that is very, very sound advice, honestly. And I'm actually taking it as if you're like you're talking to me individually, huh? because part of the thing is that I one of the reasons I've given, let me not say give up, but technically somehow I have, is that obsession with people and personalities. Um, no, you can't give up now, darling. I know, like I know, I'm too, I'm too young win. to be jaded. So I shouldn't be, um, mm. but 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 I, you can't and, let them win. And, yeah, and the thing is, I try to talk to people. Every time I try to talk to people, they always bring up personalities, and I and I ask, okay, why why this person? Fine, if you like a personality, but I agree with you that there isn't much conversation around the issues, and just I think a lot of people that that will share this this with will definitely love to hear that from you that you know we need to focus on the issues whatever issues it is that we care about you know doesn't matter what it is and what I also appreciate is that you are using opportunity to actually mean something positive not opportunity in that we all have the same twenty four hours opportunity but opportunity mm. in the room for change yes things are wrong things are messed yeah. up there's something broken but room for change which is a whole different yeah. narrative to you know. Uh, capitalist who have the same 24 hours make money under COVID um, narrative yeah. that we usually hear. Thank you so much for that advice. Um, okay, I know you're busy, so I'm going to go yeah. off with um, the last three questions. Whatever comes to your mind first is what you say. So the first one is, in a, in a perfect world, things would go back post-pandemic. Uh, not in a perfect world, but services, places will be open. What is the first place or activity that you know that you would like to to partake of or to go to? I'd like to go to Doppio Zero, my favorite restaurant in Rosebank, and sit outside in a nice winter sun and have a mojito with a group of Black feminist friends. What is the one thing in your routine or day-to-day life that has changed or that you have become more intentional about as a result of the current situation? I listen to music and music is saving my life right now. Mm -hmm. I I literally sit and and do nothing. You know, normally I listen to music while I'm doing something else. Now I'm like sitting there listening to the song. I have a very good friend who happens to have a radio show. And I have become his producer. Oh, wow. (laughs) As in... I know what genre is happening Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So I am now putting together the playlist. Like, and I'm having so much fun. I mean, he's he's like completely shocked. He's like, you want to do my job? I'm like, sweetie, you have no idea what this means to me, like emotionally, looking for music, putting it together, looking at the biographies of, you know, the, the, the artists, what awards they've recently won. It's, it's been absolutely fascinating, the most fascinating. And, and, and of course, you know, he suddenly noticed, which he didn't notice before, that 80% of the music that I give him is women, right? Yes. right? Because subconsciously, I just say to myself, okay, house music. I knew nothing about house music, mm-hmm. right? Like, I, 
it's not a genre that I'm I'm a reggae fan. So if you ask me about reggae artists, I will tell you all their latest albums, all the men and the women and who they are married to. <laughs> but house music, I knew nothing. Suddenly, I sit there and I do a Google search. I just went, black women, house music. And I discovered that actually house music started off as a black women's genre. And I'm like, there we go. So if- now we got black women on radio. And he's like, where are you getting this stuff from? Said, That's what you should be doing. It's your job. You're supposed to be researching this stuff. But I'm having so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so now I, and I sit there and I listen to the songs because of course I'm very clear I'm not having any dirty lyrics yeah. in videos. So yeah. it has to be empowering feminist enough, you know, progressive politics. Yeah. And, and so yeah. That's great. Mm. Now, the last thing, the last question would be, um, one thing that has come up that you, or it might be the music thing, that has come up during this time that you want to keep within with, within your, your, your routine, your experiences, or one thing that has come up either for you personally or the world? I do have to say, I quite like the social distancing <laughs> places. <laughs> really? I know what you mean. I, you know, yeah. it's yeah. like the other day somebody forgot, right? Behind me in, in, in clicks in the in the pharmacy. Somebody forgot. And I'm going, ah. you're too close. Yeah. You know. Because it is so annoying. And and, and I and I don't know, but I have to put it in context. Yeah. The reason that people then often don't respect personal space is particularly when you're short, when you're female. And when you're black, right? Like that's true. you are, it's like get out of the way, right? That's true. That's like, true. Or if you're standing by the till and talking to the woman at the till, yeah. I mean, you might be discussing the price of the thing or something that's, you know, especially in this country. Yeah. Then the white people are like, "Can you hurry up?" And then they come and they start pushing, or even they come, you know, very aggressive. Now it's like two meters, honey, two yeah. meters. You and you're yeah. staying there. I, I, I agree. Yeah. I like that. I like that. That's true. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that's all for it. That's all for today. And I, I know I took so much of your time. I appreciate it. No, but no, be- it's fine. 